Hello, it's me. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Just, uh, so, oh, we got more people. Who do we got? Samuel hey. Robertson and Mike. <laughs> I a lot of questions. Yeah, all right, cool. So we're going to have an active session today. How's everybody doing? Uh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. How's everybody doing? Good, good. I'm going to take out my retainers, though. Cool. So, Samuel Robertson, can you hear us? He's Sound mute. issue. Oh, nice. I heard you. All right, cool. All right, so who wants to go first? You know me, ladies first. Oh. I'm calling if no one else wants to go first. If you right. tell me when to stop, I have a list. <laughs> All right, well, start at the top of your list. We got okay, an hour. So, awesome. So I went through the NL case um, as far as the motion to strike. Okay. One of, the fav one of the favorite things that I saw that I didn't know before is that the pleading standard enumerated in Toombley and Iqbal applies with equal force um, to affirmative defenses. Yep. So I didn't know that. Um, oh, well, now you know. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's great. Um, so the first question is, is there a time frame in filing a 12F motion? Uh, yeah, there actually is. Hold on one second, though. Hey, James! There's somebody on Patreon, this uh, Don Haslam, that's trying to get on office hours. Can you help him out? He just sent a, he just sent a message through Patreon. Can you get on there and... Just help the guy out. Are you on Patreon? I'm no, I'm on I'm on office hours. I got five people now. I'm looking for the office hours meeting. I sent him the video link for him to watch it and figure out how to set it up. The video um, that I sent contains everything that he would need to know to download. How long ago did you send this? Because he sent this to Today. me. Yeah, but when he Early just sent in this. the morning. So I mean, obviously he's struggling because I don't think it's he watched the video. One. I'll tell him to watch the video. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell him we'll be here for probably an hour because there's a lot of people and they have questions. All right, cool. Sorry about that, guys. So, uh, Missa, go, go ahead. I cut you off in the middle of your question. No problem. So the first question is, is there a time frame in filing the 12F motion? Yes, there is. If you look at, what is it, FRCP Rule 15, I believe, tells you the time within which you can respond with something when somebody files an answer. I want to say it's 20 days, but it may be 14. You'll need to look at the rule. Got it. Okay, um, so the other question I have is, is there a motion to strike example towards C a CPS agency? What do you mean? Um, so the one for NL, that one's against Children's Hospital. Um, uh -huh. Is there another example like that's directed towards like County of LA, County of San Diego? Oh, uh, there, there may be. I'll have to look for it. You might look on. Um, uh, let's see off the top of my head. Who can I think of? I don't actually remember as I'm sitting. You know, Dunn might have had one. That was. I don't know. I don't know who he actually has up there to tell you the truth. I gotta look at Patreon and see which ones are, are made available. If you can read me the list of names, I can tell you if any of those, just out of memory, would have it in them. I can scroll through them at a later time. It's just if you had it at the top of your head. Yeah, I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm gonna have to go look through them. But it's gonna be the same principle, the same stuff's gonna apply. What the counties usually do is they'll plead a bunch of negligence defenses as affirmative defenses, and negligence just has no place in a 1983 claim. Similarly with the defenses, they just have no place in a 1983 affirmative defense. So that's always going to be a good basis to uh, move to strike them. Right. The, so the kind of the list of that we have is um, failure to suit a claim, plaintiff's contributory negligence, assumption of the risk, not yeah. in scope of employment, Failure to mitigate damages, author authorized conduct, immunity. Yeah, th this is this is going to be the problem they face with most of those affirmative defenses. Like, uh, what was the one? That, not failure to state a claim, but also failure to state a claim. In the Ninth Circuit, there's there is no such affirmative defense. But there's other there's other things that you read off there. Read me the list again. I'll tell you the first one that has the the problem I'm thinking of, and then I'll explain what that problem is. 
Okay, plaintiff's contributory negligence. Okay, that's a neg that's a negligence type defense has no place in a nineteen eighty three claim. Got it. Assumption of the risk. Same thing has no. Pl how, how do you assume the risk that somebody's going to violate your constitutional rights? How do you do that? Right, right. And so that's yeah. why I was like, let me. This would be a good topic now that I'm at this stage. Uh, another one is not in scope of employment. Okay, uh, not hit. Hold, hold on. Let's just stop right there. Not in scope of employment. So what does that mm -hmm. sound like? That's, that um, sounds like they're denying something that you have to prove, right? Yes. It's your burden to prove that all this conduct was done within the course and scope of employment, right? Correct. So if they're just saying, no, it's not, that's a denial. That's not an affirmative defense. It, it, that's subject to a motion to strike. They're just denying the allegations of the complaint. Got it. Um, okay. fail oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. What's the next one? Failure to mitigate damages. Okay, that there's there's you know an argument on argument on both sides of that. You know, once you're you sustain an injury, you do have an obligation to try to mitigate the the injury, right? But if if the injury they're referencing is the violation of your constitutional rights, once your constitutional rights are violated, there's no way to mitigate it. The violation's done. It's like turning on and off a light switch. You either have the light switch on or it's off, right? There's no mitigation. So so that's that's the argument on the constitutional right side, but usually what ends up happening is you'll sustain some emotional distress injury as a result of the violation, or you'll sustain a physical injury, maybe death as the re result of a violation. So in that sense, you know, if you sustain some emotional type injury or some, some you know, mental injury, pain, anguish, stuff like that, anxiety, you do have an obligation to try to mitigate that, it's like go to therapy, do things to get better. You can't just sit around malingering and, and claim somehow it's their fault. So, right. so there's an argument on both sides of that depending on what injury they're going after. What's, what's your next one? Okay, authorized conduct. What? Authorized conduct. Authorized, yeah. authorized by who? Authorized by plaintiff. Okay, so they're saying basically consent? Yes. That is a proper affirmative defense in a seizure claim. Okay. Or what about um, retaliation? What? What about for a retaliation claim? Oh, um, well, not really. Cons you don't ever really consent to retaliation, do you? It's really only going to apply to something that you would normally have the opportunity to consent to, and that's going to be the seizure itself. Got it. Now, if the, retali if the re retaliation claim is based on the seizure, you're saying, they seized my kid to retaliate for something I did, then consent could be an affirmative defense. Okay. So the next one is immunity. Immunity, they're allowed to plead it. Well, it depends. Did they just plead immunity, or did they plead absolute immunity, or qualified immunity, or what? Um, so they have on here, let's see. Answer go. Um, Okay, so the immunity is um, under California government code section. Well, actually, there's one, two, three. Oh, hold on, stop right there. Are you alleging state law-based claims? Yes. Okay, so so let's retract a little bit because some of the negligence affirmative defenses will apply if you you know, alleged a state law negligence claim or a breach of mandatory duty claim, some of those defenses will apply to those claims, but they have to call out in each affirmative defense what claims they're they're saying they apply to. Got it. Okay, I'll dig into that one a little bit more. Um, the next one is abstention. What kind of abstention? Younger, Colorado Denver, River Doctrine? Younger and Rooker Feldman. Hmm. 
that. Is that going to be an affirmative defense? I don't know that that's a proper affirmative defense. I think you're going to have to research that one. Normally, the way the way it happens is they'll raise Rucker Feldman or Younger, Colorado River, or whatever, in a motion to dismiss. The judge will rule on it. That's the end of it. Got it. I I normally don't see them. I mean, I, I've seen it before, but I normally don't see it because that's you know like something where if they have it and they're going to make it, they want to make it right up front. Got it. And the next one is collateral stop. Collateral estoppel could be an affirmative defense. Okay, and then the last one is statute of limitations. Statute of limitations, look at the rule on that. They have to specifically identify not only the statute that applies, but the specific facts that would bring you within that statute. Okay, um, yeah, it looks very much like a blanket. Um. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of them will just say, oh, the applicable statute of limitations uh, bars the action. And they won't say, okay, which, which statute of limitations. Right. And that, that's improper. That doesn't meet the requirements of uh, Iqbal Twombly. Got it. So, um, yeah, that one covers my list. Can you come back? Okay, and last question is, can the defendants come back with an amended answer to cure the defects asserted yes. in the strike? Okay. Yes, and in fact, what you should do is, what's proper to do is meet and confer with the defendants, write them a little letter, tell them all the defects, and, the, and you know, with your legal support, citing your authority for your claim that it's defective, and um, in fact, you're required to do that in the central district before you file your motion anyway, you have to meet and confer with them, and then usually what will happen is the defendants, depending on who the attorney is, the defendants will go ahead and amend their answer so you won't have to file a motion. Okay, cool. Those are my questions. Okay, cool. Who's next? Don, I see you made it on, man. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> so who's, who, who, who's next? Hearing... I'll go. No, oh, okay. Nobody has anything. Yep, go ahead, yep. Mike. Um... Just a general question to start with. Um, do you know any cases uh, that uh, case law that ha references the uh, um, importance of uh, you know due process in a uh, juvenile dependency case, or uh, you know cases that state the importance of uh, information being factual and not subjective? Yeah, yeah, see. yeah, 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 yeah. There's a recent one. It's Casey N. v. County of Orange or Vrekin, something like that. That that just came out, I think, last year, maybe even within the last 10 months, something like that. Then there's also the Hardwick case. It's going to be Presley Hardwick versus... That's the one. It's Pre Presley Hardwick versus either County of Orange or Marsha Vrekin. I don't remember. And then the other one's KCN versus County of Orange. But both of them, one is, yeah, KCN, C-A-S-E-Y, then the letter, capital letter N versus County of Orange. That's a state case, 4th District Court of Appeal. And then the Presley Hardwick case, that's a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. So you have one in federal court and one in state court. They both essentially say the thing, same thing. As a social worker reporting to the court, you can't freaking lie. You know, it's pretty okay. ba pretty basic. One okay, thing I, I one thing I do need to to repeat again. I know that you guys recognize that this is all screen recorded, and then th that we put them up on YouTube for everybody who couldn't make it or wasn't a subscriber or whatever. But I do need to mention that every now and then. So don't say if you want something kept private, don't say it here. No worries. Um, so I, I got a response back from my. Um, a two seven petition, which uh, it was denied. Uh, denied. On, right. They um, denied it based on other uh, option. Um, well, they did two two X's. They said uh, the petitioner uh, has not shown good cause for the release of the requested records, and then also check D, which was other, and they said the request is also denied as moot. They see item six for further explanation and. Uh, when I originally requested it, I stated I needed it for my appeals case that was currently, uh, you know, in in motion. Oh, uh, that's that's why it's moot. Who was doing your appeal? Were you doing it yourself, or did you have an attorney doing it? 
uh, I had an attorney doing it. Yeah. And the, uh, they said basically since he filed the uh, opening brief on August 7th, and of course they responded to my uh, petition on August 20th. Yeah, it's moved. Um, they said it. So basically what I'm doing, though, is I'm going to file it again um, based on the fact that I would need it for my current defamation case. Uh, which has actually been filed in current, and then also advised them that I'm had a pending um, civil complaint. Uh, I didn't say exactly what that complaint consisted of, uh, you know, because I didn't want to let them know I'm going to, you know, go above them to the federal. But I also put that there. Now, well, am I allowed to? Nor normally, file again? yeah, you can file again. Those are always without prejudice. But normally, what we do is, if we've got a complaint already filed, we'll just attach it to the 827. And we'll say, okay, look, we've got this ongoing litigation. The records are essential to the discovery process in the federal case. Give us the records. Not only that, but as a party, I mean, this, is, this sounds really weird because as a party to the underlying juvenile dependency proceeding, you're entitled to a copy of the records. Yeah, that was my second question. I, I did some research, and I understand that uh, according to the uh, Welfare and Institute Code, it states that I have um, a right to view the case file without a court order and a require a court order for copies of the case file. Uh, is yes. that accurate? Yes. So when I file my uh, go run at it again, do I have ground to claim to view it uh, at that time? Because obviously they got the file back because they had to review it to deny it. Um, what are my yeah. odds of you know getting to view it, or how how does that work? Do you well, have any? Uh, you you, you get you get to view it just under the statute. You have a right to view it. The issue with an eight twenty seven petition for you as a party to the underlying case is whether or not you're going to get a full copy of it. Right? You have a you have an absolute right to go view it. Now, would I do that at the the court or at the age at the agency Both. itself? Both. Okay. Okay. That's good. To, good to hear. Um, now, I did also in my in my second uh, notice to them. Basically, I also asked for it to be approved for use in the defamation under seal. So I should get a two for one if I do. Um, they should address both of those. You know, also give me a copy of what they feel I'm you know entitled to, and then speak to me allowing to use it under seal. Uh, in the defamation case, correct? Yeah, that should be that should be fine. Okay, um, let me see. Um, let me ask you gen another general question. What's your understanding of what a mandatory reporter expectations are? Mandatory reporter, at least insofar as I understand it, to the extent that they have witnessed something or are in possession of sufficient evidence to give rise to a reasonable suspicion that the child has been the victim of some kind of abuse, then they have a mandatory obligation under the penal code to report it to the appropriate authorities. Abuse or neglect, correct? Yeah, it's abuse or neglect. To a, to a child. Yeah, that's correct. So the defendant in this particular case, I think that's uh, like I think that's like Penal Code Section One 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 Six or something like that. But it's it's laid out very clearly the language of the Penal Code. It tells you exactly what the circumstances are. And basically, what my research has uncovered is it's a child or elderly uh, individual. That's whatever the statute says. If that's in the statute, I haven't looked at it in a long, so, long time. So my defendant is using, uh, she responded to my um, summons and uh, service uh, claiming that uh, she's exempt from defamation because she's a mandatory reporter and that the um, statements that she made were factual and happening to her, but nothing that was stated or claimed had anything to do with the child. So I just want to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding what a mandatory reporter is you know that's well 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 and only certain types of people are going to be mandatory reporters like for for example in a medical field oh okay like a nurse or a doctor or something like that that's correct yeah okay nurses well, from what i understand nur from what nurse, i understand she's a nurse yeah nurses are mandatory reporters for children or elderly 
individuals, not, you know, adults. That was something that I feel that so she should have addressed. I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding. Did she, did she report that you were, like, somehow injured? Or what do you mean for adults? No, like, like somebody's giving, you know, if they know or witness elderly abuse, something like that, you know, as a mandatory reporter, they're supposed to report that. So wait, why are you suing this woman? For defamation of uh, claims uh, she made stating that I, uh, you know, tried to hack her, um, her uh, bank account, her Venmo, her Golden One account, uh, oh. vandalized her car. So uh, how, with, okay, so that her statements that you're suing her for had nothing to do with child abuse or suspected child abuse? Or neglect, correct. Oh, that's so, just, that's just stupid then. She's just an yeah, does she have a exactly. lawyer? Does she have a lawyer that did this, or did she just do that on her own? She did it on her own. Okay, um, well that that explains a lot. Right, because uh, when I took it to the legal aid at the uh, courthouse at the law library, um, they were actually confused on her denial of what she checked and what she was claiming. They were like, "Well, one, you know, they usually don't even accept a general denial in defamation cases, and then you know the, the selections that she made just were kind of contradicting the." Uh, you know each other so i'm really not worried about it i just wanted to make sure that i understood uh mandatory reporters obligations and that's usually you know child abuse or neglect to a child which they are supposed to report to you know social services but these claims that she's making should have been reported to the authorities which i did serve her a request for discovery uh you know asking you know particular questions such as those you know did you ever report it so we'll see what i get back and I believe I have 30 days plus five um, before I can request a, um, I forget what the verbiage is, where they forced discovery to be. Um, did you file uh, this, did you, did you file this in state court or where'd you file this thing? A state. All right, well, there's a 20 day hold on discovery from the time that you serve your, your summons. After that 20 days passes, just as a matter of law, you don't have to do anything special. Discovery opens. You can start serving subpoenas, you know, production requests, interrogatories, whatever. I did all of that. Uh, oh, so she hasn't responded to it yet? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, she's still, she's still within a grace period before I can actually have it ordered, you know, by the court. Um, so I just wanted to make sure because on my uh, ADR... Mm -hmm. or alternative dispute resolution you know they they give you some things of you know what the uh, judge is going to you know ask and one of them is like you know how's the discovery coming along and i want to make sure that i had you know either receive something or have something to speak to come the time that we have uh you know to show appear in court so i just want to make sure yeah. i was covering all my you know due diligence here yeah, I I think you're fine on that. And if she if she doesn't respond within the appropriate time, all of her objections that she could have interposed are waived, and then you can just move to compel. Yeah, compel discovery. That's right. Yeah. Now that brings me to her. Uh, I did receive a call actually last week uh, from her insurance uh, from Farmers asking mm -hmm. me, um, you know, to give them a call um, in regards <laughs> to some clarification on the. Um, declaration that I had submitted um, do you have any uh, advice on best practices when speaking with insurance companies I know at the end of the so, day they are here to protect themselves and the you know client so I want to make sure I don't yeah. you know, put myself in rock in a hard place so does she have uh, like homeowners insurance or something that's covering this I, I, I would assume so um, but okay. I didn't uh, get into it because I didn't call them back. I wanted to make sure I did some research first on you know how to engage uh, with them. I don't know. You know I don't. I don't know if I would call them back because what it sounds like is they're trying to figure out whether or not there's coverage, and if there's coverage, then they'll put one of their attorneys on it. And then, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, and they got big time, you know, lawyers. Then yeah. when it comes to that, yeah. So I'd be I'd be careful about it. Okay. Uh, well, I'll tread lightly. I mean, they call me twice. If, if they do it a third time, then, uh, you know, maybe I'll uh, have limited responses for them. Um, and then I had, uh, I think I have one more here. And I think that was, uh, that was it. I appreciate it as always.
Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Sounds like that one's inching along. Yes, yeah, better than I expected, other than the uh, 827 <laughs> denial, but I, I'm not going to give up. They're not going to get off the hook that easy. Yeah, yeah, just keep pumping on that. Something will something will break free. Definitely. All right, anybody else? Well, I have a question, um, kind of a general question following up on that with the uh, motion to compel, because um, I'm in a situation um, where, so Discovery, like, it will have a two-part question. One, I got Discovery, and um, I got served 127 interrogatories. Are you in state? Are you in state court or federal court? Yeah, this, this is a state court. Um, it's actually kind of a just a general case thing. So, so, and I was going to uh, go for a motion to protect, but the attorney had told me like, well, that I would it would be denied, and then I would be liable for. The cost incurred. What attorney? Defended. What attorney? Oh, this is. Oh, it's. It's not. A, it's not even a county attorney. It's a private attorney. Um. So it's. It's kind of. It's, I'm just asking a general kind of question. Um, okay. So I had. So I conferred with her, and she informed me that it, you know that that she had the right to discovery and blah blah blah. Gave me her whole. She's kind of a bully. So gave me her whole spiel, and I said, I well, I was going to go for a motion to protect and. Did she do it? Hold, hold on. Did she do a declaration of necessity? Yes, she did. Okay, go ahead. But, I mean, it's 120. Like, there's and not only that. But there's, there's. She did interrogatories. Um, you know, there's over 100 uh, requests for um, you know, um, admission. Like this, or admission. There's a bunch of this. Yeah. It's, it's substantial. It's overwhelmingly substantial. And so. What she, what county are you located in? This is L.A. County. But so she, um, she did tell me that she could give me, she would agree to give me more time if I needed more time. And I had informed her, yes, well, I'm going to be out of town for a couple of weeks. And um, so uh, I told her the soonest, you know, this was in uh, May. So then July. So then immediately she, um, we verbally agreed to extend the time. And I did not follow it up with um, a agreement. Uh, well, that was a that was a big mistake. Anytime you have an agreement on discovery to extend time, you follow it up with a confirming email immediately and right. ask the other side to go ahead and acknowledge it. Right. Yeah, I, I didn't and um, so she put in a motion to compel. Yeah, now, 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 now you're fucked. Really? Well, can't you but can't I <laughs> okay. can't I um, a, a, kind of explained because she she also didn't even include in her um, motion to compel that that we had even spoken um you know basically she just acted like i ignored all of it and who's so the attorney friend, who's the who's the attorney oh her name is barbara mandel barbara mandel um, oh I, should, I don't even know if i should say this is, but um can't i uh, if if i comply with it and I do not contest the. My understanding, from what I read in the law, is that the that they they um, the judges they can order sanctions for if I contest it or if I don't comply. But if it gets to there and I've complied with it by the, the hearings in November, so if I comply with the discovery request and don't contest the motion to compel, and then also ask. Um, request, you know, explain it and put in a motion to be relieved from the default. I'm sure you've never had to do that because you've called your attorney and you go about it the correct way, but is that, would that be proper? I can't apply for... You, can, a, you, can, you can ask for anything you want, but right. if, I, if I'm the attorney on the other side, I'm going to say, well, look, she had her opportunity. She didn't deal with it. She waited until I filed a motion to compel. I had to spend the time to file that motion in order to get compliance. Doesn't matter to me, Judge, that we haven't had a hearing because she decided not to contest it. I still had to spend that time, and my client still had to spend that money. So I want to be paid. And, you know, I don't know what the right. judge is going to do with that. But the, the lesson here is, number one, Anytime you have an agreement, get it in writing or confirm it in writing and have them acknowledge it. If they don't, then act accordingly. Right. Se secondarily, you know, undertake serious efforts to timely comply. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, this, so this is this is this is no bullshit. Once you're in litigation, it's no bullshit. The consequences of of you know not meeting deadlines, especially statutory. Well, not just losing the whole case, but you're going to get fined potentially. You may get a yeah. sanction, thousands of dollars, because you didn't comply with the timeline. So, that this is for everybody. You know, once you're in it, it's no bullshit. You take it seriously. Yeah, and well, I was. Uh, uh, um, well, I don't know, my thought just left me, but um, yeah, uh, I was just hoping because of because of the extraordinary. I mean, it's 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 rather extreme considering the limits are like thirty five. Yeah, you know, those 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 limits in state court are really not real. I mean, I, I have I have cases where I've done eighteen hundred interrogatories over the course of a year. Oh, really? Yeah, all you have to do okay. is a dec- all you have to do is a declaration of necessity, and nobody ever is you know challenges those or is, is successful challenging those. Right. Yeah, okay. in in federal court now, totally different story. Under the FRCP, you only get twenty five interrogatories. And if you need more, you have to go to the judge, you have to file a motion, you have to make an extreme showing of good cause. It's, uh, it's really a chore. In state court, right. yeah, in state court, totally different deal. Huh, okay. Yeah. Live and learn. Yeah, well, always. That's, that's what we're here for, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, anybody else have questions? Don? Anything? Samuel, anything? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. So, well, I don't really have a case right now, but I'm planning on starting one, but I'm in Texas. Okay. And I know I talked to you before about how sovereign immunity and whatnot, but I, there's no sovereign immunity if I sue the social worker. There's no um, sovereign immunity anyway. That That's all... No? Well... No, hold on. Sovereign immunity. You're, you're suing... You're in the state of Texas, and I'm assuming... Mm-hmm that the the social services agency is actually a state agency not a county agency is that right uh correct yes okay yeah so you, there's no sovereign immunity for the individual social worker there is sovereign immunity for the state so, so my question was uh with when i do write the complaint against mm-hmm. the social worker do i do it in personal capacity or official or both no, you're going to do it in her individual capacity. If you do it in her official yeah. capacity, that's the same as just suing the state. And you're going to get blown okay. out on 11th immunity if you do that. I, I wouldn't even do it because it'll confuse the judge and, mm-hmm. you know, he'll just come in and want to shit all over you. And another thing, too, um, is it going to be in federal court or state court? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. I'm not familiar with the venue out there. I'm not familiar with the mm-hmm. veneer. I can tell you that here, depending on what county you're in, like in Orange County, I'd file it in state court if I could get away with it, and actually uh, pay the extra fee to file it in the civil complex division, because you get some really good judges there who, who really are going to do the work. And if the county doesn't remove you get the state jury uh, requirements, and that's only nine votes out of 12, as opposed to federal court where you have to have unanimity. That's a good point. So, um, I mean, I guess you, you, you gotta look at what your rules are. I, I, don't, I don't know out there, so I, I mean, I couldn't really tell you what my preference would be, because I, I just don't know what the rules are in your county. And would it be like a federal claim, or? Uh, 1983 claim? Yeah, 1983 claims a federal claim. I mean, did they lie about you? Did they take the kids without a warrant? I mean, you got you, you got to have also, an underlying constitutional okay. or federal law violation to support so here's the 1983 thing. claim. So here's the thing: I'm the uncle, so I don't really have a right to do anything. But I'm going to law school, okay. so I'm planning on writing it. So my sister's in current in a CPS case. I have my niece with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm planning on writing it after the case is over with. Uh-huh. And relation to my sister, and then when I graduate law school, I'll jump in as the attorney to oh. represent her in the case. Okay, yeah. right on. Just so wa- I'm gonna wa- write everything. Just, it's got to figure how I'm going to do it. Yeah, just watch out for your statutes of limitations. And what you do is yeah. just have her file it pro se right before a statute runs, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know beg with the court for more time to serve it, more time to do everything that'll give you time to finish law school, pass the bar, and do your thing. Yeah. So when do you graduate? When do you finish? 
uh, 2026. I gotta make it last long. Oh wow, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm part time, so. Yeah, it's three years, man. You gotta, you gotta drag. When does their, know. when does their statute run? Uh, July 2025. Oh. Well, that's not so bad. You just drag this no. thing out to July 2025, file it, and then don't well, serve long? it, and then get the judge to give you more time to serve it. You can probably get two or three of those before the judge says no, and then uh, serve it, and then start having her make deals with the other side to delay things, and you, yeah. can, probably, you can probably stretch it out until you get licensed. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, and if you don't, you know, the child, their statute of limitations doesn't even run until the, it doesn't even start to run until they're 18. Mm -hmm. At least on the 1983 yeah. claims. On state law claims, different story. You know, there's a little bit more analysis. Go Actually, you're in Texas, so I don't even know what the analysis would be. It's different law. It's probably similar, but, um, yeah. So you can probably stretch this thing out. That's kind of cool. Uh, regarding like the, I guess the flurry of motions, I guess uh, with the, the general like the motion. Well, the actual would be twelve B if it's in state court, but um, how long does it normally last for, a court to get to that point? Is it pretty quick? What What do you mean? Where the so after you file the uh, the complaint and you serve everybody, and then they start filing the motions to dismiss. Oh yeah. Anything? Right. Is it pretty it quick or? It depends on your judge, man. If you're in federal court, I have one here. It was the other side filed their 12B motion in February. I just got a call from the court last week asking for a courtesy copy of the opposition. So what's that, 10 months, 9 months? You know, it's, it, it just depends on what court you're in. Who knows? I'm, I'm just hoping that I don't want to file it and then my sister has to go up there and represent herself and it's going to be really bad. Won't be very good for her if she does it herself. Well, well, nobody's nobody's gonna file any motions until they get served. So the the way that, okay. and I've done this a few times here where I was just too busy, but I had to file something to meet a statute, you know, statute limitations. So I file the complaint, and you get like whatever it is, thirty days or something, sixty days to serve it. Depends on local rules, and. On like the fiftieth day, I filed an ex party application to get another ninety days, and then I filed another ex party application when that ran out to get another ninety days, and on the third one, the judge in his order said, uh, "This is your last continuance, your last extension, and I'm not giving you ninety days. You got sixty days." So then I, you know, got everybody served, but I, I was able to draw it out like almost what. Like 120 days, 180 days, something like that. Pretty long. I hope I can do something like that. What? I hope I can do something like that. Yeah, well, you just try. Yeah. You know, the, the worst just that can try. happen. <laughs> worst that can happen is the judge says no. True. Right. Is so. there any? Have you ever asked for any like type of injunctive relief at all? Yeah. Or no, money and, damages. And that's a that's a waste of time. Judges aren't going to okay. give injunctive relief on this stuff. Okay. Yeah. I just always go for money damages. I've I've tried, and uh, I think it's Pellerin. We did a motion for injunctive relief, and the judge said, so, "Nah." I don't know what you would ask for anyway. With injunctive relief. Well, in, in, well, in, in Pellerin, the issue was that they didn't have a warrant um, statute or policy or training or anything else, and they were refusing to implement anything. So we we're looking for an order from the federal district court you know, mandating that they at least put together a warrant procedure. Mm -hmm. And what they did is they, in the interim, they enacted a statute, a warrant statute, and that kind of cured the problem. But uh, the judge wasn't going to give us injunctive relief anyway. That, just, that was just one more reason not to. Okay. Yeah. I have one more question. One more question. Oh. Sure. Um, so I know, like, one of the just like, I think it was Misa that was talking about it, um, how she's going through the motions for dismissal. Uh -huh. She's talking about how, like, a consent was involved, or they raised the consent that she... Oh, she was talking about... Whatever action they did. Yeah, she was talking about their affirmative defenses, right? Yes, yes, those. Um, if my sister told them that she wanted her daughter to go with me, and they refused to... Do you mm -hmm. think that would raise to a 1983 claim or no? No. 
No. No, they have discretion when they're placing with family or anybody else. Mm-hmm. They, if, if they come up with any bullshit reason why the child shouldn't go with you, then that's generally going to be good enough. Not always, but generally. Unless they lied about the reason. You know, you still have a right, even though you're not involved in the case, you still have a right well, not, not to be lied about. Well, so I know they, my mom, the, the night she was removed, my mom called me. I was in school, law school. She mm-hmm. said, can you go out to that area and go pick her up? It's two hours away. So my mom gave me the number to the social worker, and then I called the social worker, and she said, no, we can't do that. Yeah, that's iffy. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. well uh, although, although, I mean, think about it for a second. What's, what's the rule on unwarranted seizures? A social worker can't lawfully remove a child from the custody of the parent unless at the time of the removal... They're in possession of specific and articulable facts to show there's an immediate danger, right, mm-hmm. of the, that the child's going to suffer severe bodily injury or death in the short time it takes to get a warrant. That's the first part of the test. The second part of the test, there's an and. There is no lesser intrusive alternative means to avert the, you know, injury they're worried about. So placement with you or allowing you you know two hours to go out there and pick up the kid that sounds like there would be a reasonable means of averting the danger right yeah but the claim wouldn't be your claim it would be the child's claim and your sister's claim your sister under the 14th amendment the child under the fourth amendment right yes yes so so, and then you also have to remember the rule that i just spouted at you that's the that's the rule in the Ninth Circuit. I think you're like in the second or the fifth or something like I'm that. I'm in the fifth. Yeah, fifth. you guys have a different rule. It may be you know totality of the circumstances or some other thing. You're gonna have to research that. I will. Now I guess I want to talk about one more thing too. So because at the time of the removal, she wasn't my niece wasn't even with her with the mom at all. She was in a hotel. By her, my, my sister was in a hotel by herself. CPS came over, investigated, whatever. Where was the she was child? Actually, she was with her aunt at the time. So and what, they called so the aunt what, to have her go to the CPS building, and that's where they removed so, her from. So, so her what, was, what was the fucking danger? There was no danger. That's the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good case. Too bad I'm not in Texas, man. <laughs> Sorry. Well, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. <laughs> so so what, what city is this in? Sulphur Springs, Texas. How far is that away from Houston, League City? Uh, I'd say about two and a half, three hours. That's dri- driving? Driving, yeah. Have you tried calling Ed Rose? He's a pilot. He's got a twin Cessna. He flies all over the place. It'd be like an hour and 15-minute flight or less for him. It says online that he retired, I believe, if I remember right from last time I checked up on him. Uh, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if that's true. It says online on his website that he retired, or just somebody blathering on some blog somewhere? I think it's on his website. Really? I believe so. I checked on it last time. This is wrong. Oh, Ed Rose. Fuck, that's kind of bizarre. I, uh... Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. Edward I'm looking at it now. A. Rose I Jr. Yeah, he got a nice appellate decision out there. He's still admitted here, man. Is he? Okay. Yeah, he sure is. That's a call mask. Yeah, I would, I would give him a call. Would that still be a uh, 1986 claim, or should it be something? No, else? it's going to be a 1983 claim. 1983 claim. Yeah, 1983 claim. Okay. And I, yeah, I, I think I, I, don't, I, I don't think he's retired. I, I mean, his LinkedIn See? stuff is active. Is Mark Dale Hubble's there? That's current. His, let me see what his uh, Kelbar thing here. Let me see what that says. Started by uh, public accountant. Yeah, he's a, yeah he's he's a tax attorney, CPA. He's done a few of these cases. Got a good published decision in Texas in the Fifth Circuit. I want to call him. Yeah, I, League City. You said League City, right? Yeah. Yeah, League City. Yeah, call him up, man. He's a pilot. If if it's an interesting case, you'll fly out there and. You know, swing yeah. a bat. He's not. He's not yeah. afraid. Okay, cool. That's awesome. If, if he can do it, then that's more power to him, I guess. 
it takes generally years to get this done, right? Yeah, these are not yeah. cases that are going anywhere fast. Okay. What right. attorney was that that you Ed, mentioned? Ed Rose. He's in Texas. Okay. You said he's admitted in California, too? He is, but he, he's highly unlikely to take one of these cases oh. here. Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. So, Miss, I got a, uh, what do you call it, chat message that you had a follow-up question if we still have time. Let, well, let me check. Or Samuel, yes. did, you have, did you have any other questions before I move on? No, you can move on. Okay. Thank you. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Nissa, go ahead. Okay, so kind of following up on my original questions, um, just using the failure to state a, a cause of action as an affirmative defense, can I still raise um, it, raise the fact that the affirmative defense fails the Iqbal Toombley standards? Where well, it's very look, look at, I think it's one of the first attacks in that NL12F motion. In the Ninth Circuit, failure to state a claim is not even a defense. It's not a, it's not a Twombly-Iqbal issue. It's just not a permissible defense. Got it. Okay, so I mean, just as to any of the affirmative defenses, if they're just vague and don't have that would any that would be Twombly Iqbal. If it's vague, they don't have any facts. You don't know what the hell they're talking about. That's Twombly Iqbal. Gotcha. If if on the other hand, it's just not. There's no legal basis in the Ninth Circuit for that defense. Then it's not Twombly Iqbal. It's that there's just no defense. Got it. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that one. Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Thank so any, you. anybody else got anything? Don, I think you've been having trouble with your mic. I got that uh, Patreon message from you saying that for some reason you're, you couldn't get unmuted. When? No, it was uh, Don, I think. Well, that's me. <laughs> oh, that's you? Well, I... Oh, well, what the hell? I got a, uh, I got from Don Haslam. Oh, that's not me. Yeah, saying that he can't get his mic to work right through DuckDuckGo. Well, that's what you get for using DuckDuckGo, man. I mean, I, I know it's good for some things, but, you know, clearly not for this. I use Thunderbird, I think, is what we use. But anyway. So, anybody else got anything before I wrap it up? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. There we go, Mike. Got to take her. Oh, no, I was going to wait till you got to one and be like, no, <laughs> you, you say it. But no, no, I don't have anything. I was just going to give you a hard time. <laughs> wait, wait, I have um, uh, something. So my question is, um, you know, because there, there are these legal doctrines um, that allow, you know, like the continuing violations theories and... Um, uh, other, you know, stuff that that you know when statute has run, especially if like they still have the children, and with the known um, tendency to retaliate. Um, so, I mean, is there is there or or just I mean, it, even if, if with continuing violations alone, and not not just that like oh it's it's repeated in the in the uh, the thing. I mean, I've been so railroaded by them. So, you know, I mean, I have claims that, that I have not run the statute, for sure, um, but th there are some that have run the statute. Um, so is there, I mean, is there, are there any cases in any 1983 where the continuing violations uh, doctrine has upheld, like? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can tell you right now that if you're going with continuing violations as your basis for your blowing the statute of limitations... Uh -huh. that that's like a Hail Mary and you're very unlikely to make it. What I would do is if you have violations that are within the statute, I would plead those. Go for those. Then in discovery, I would loop back in the, the old conduct or the stuff that's beyond the statute. There's nothing that prevents you from bringing old stuff in as evidence for its evidentiary value. But, you know, to prove, like, intent or mode of operation, that sort of thing. But, um, or maybe even punitive damages if they've done this to you over and over and over again. So they're knowingly doing bad things. But, 
you know, if you're relying on continuing violation doctrine to get over a statute of limitations problem or a claim that's, you know, three, four years old, whatever, you know, good luck to you. Really? Well, even, I mean, is there, can you then plead, like, all of them and just some of them not meet the statute? I'll you tell know, you like, what, I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, like you, you absolutely can't. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If I'm the judge, I see a pro per coming in, pleading everything under the sun, including stuff that everybody, including the pro per, knows are beyond the statute of limitations. I'm going to take, you know, my green eye shade accountant position with my very sharp pencil, and I'm going to hack and slash and cut and do everything I can to dump that shit. So, so the answer is yes. You, you can plead anything you want. And maybe you'll get lucky. You'll get a judge that, uh, you know, is going to take a kind eye towards you. But, you know, it's a crapshoot. Right. And you don't think the continuing... I mean, because, the, the, you know, there's... there's it's, it's, I, don't, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Two things I got going on here that I'm going to respond to your question. Number, number one, I'm not here to give legal advice or legal counsel. Right. And, and what you're asking for is both. Okay. Sec second, secondarily, I don't know enough about your case to tell you whether or not that's going to work. And I'm not going to ask you enough about your case to tell you whether or not it's going to work because, again, that's going to be legal advice. <laughs> right, right. That's the problem. Um, well, so, yeah, no, no, my question is just that if you knew of any cases where it had been successful at all, like even, I, even outside of a, a child, you know, child welfare. Yeah, I, I, I don't, but I don't. But I haven't done the research. Okay. So. There it is. I mean, that's yeah, that's the basic thing. There, there may be stuff out there, but I haven't done enough research to satisfy myself that, you know, there is or is not one way or the other. So I, I really don't feel comfortable, you know, telling you, oh yeah, here you go, or oh no, it's a dead duck. So and but but the, so them lying in current um, like reports. Then that's like current. About, that's that's current. I mean, they can't lie about you. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and every every time <laughs> they have so, you know, and new not even just the old stuff in the reports. It's it's uh you know I've been, yeah. This is like an inside job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if they're lying about you, that's that's current stuff. Okay. And and those statutes, you know, you're I, I presume you're in California, so it's a two year statute on your you know, claims over current violations. Right. So you can basically have a two year look back period. Whatever they've done to you within the last two years that's on the table. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Okay. Okay. Cool. Can I you, one more. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what is the fundamental purpose of an affirmative defense? And if it's removed from the answer, can those defenses be used elsewhere, such as another motion or something like that? Well, well that gets into a deeper conversation than we can really cover in seven minutes. But fundamentally, an affirmative defense is new matter. Essentially, what an affirmative defense does is says okay yeah I admit everything you're saying is true let's just assume for argument everything you're saying is true I did these horrible things but right the affirmative defense is the but but I get off the hook because of whatever the affirmative defense uh, is that's that's why mere denials are not sufficient because you can't say okay for argument's sake, I did everything you claim, but I didn't do everything you claim, right? So that's why you can distinguish denials from actual affirmative defenses. In fact, that's that's sort of an easy litmus test is ask yourself, okay, they admit they did everything I claim, but, and then whatever comes after the but, is it something where they're saying, I really don't admit it? Or are they saying, this legal doctrine protects me? Right. So anyway, that's that's essentially what a, uh, an affirmative defense is. It's 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 an admission for argument purposes only that everything you're saying is true, and they would be liable 
but there's some legal doctrine that protects them. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Okay, and what was the other part of your question? I don't remember it. If the uh, affirmative defenses are removed from the answer, can any of can these defenses, affirmative defenses, be raised at a later time? Uh, that's going to depend on number one, how and why it was removed. Number two, what type of affirmative defense it is. Like for example, jurisdictional defenses, like Colorado River Doctrine. That's a jurisdictional defense that uh, can be pled at any time, even for the first time on appeal. So in that sense, if it's a jurisdictional defense, then no, that's not waived, it's not obviated, it still can be come back any time. Now if they've removed affirmative defenses because right now they don't have sufficient information to support them, well, what's the rule? What's the rule under the FRCP regarding amendment? with new information uh, you can amend? Well, generally speaking, leave to amend is freely granted so long as it's not going to delay or, or fuck with the trial. Right. And that's, that's true for both the plaintiff and the defendant. So if they discover evidence that will support the affirmative defense, you know, they can move for leave to amend. You can oppose it, but, you know, generally speaking, they're probably going to get it if it's in good faith, if it's real. So just the fact that it's removed now, especially if it's voluntarily removed, doesn't necessarily mean they can't try to bring it back later. Now, if it's removed by motion, like they can, you know, you, you attack it, they can test it, the judge makes a decision, it's highly unlikely it's going to come back unless they have new information that the judge was not able to consider at the time that he made the initial decision. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so... I guess the simple answer to your question is no. Got it. And the last part of the question is, can any other kind of defense be listed on the answer other than affirmative defenses? No, there, there, there's no such thing as anything other than an affirmative defense. I, I'm not sure what I mean, what you mean. Okay, just, I don't know, if, I, I know we kind of talked about the affirmative defenses, the but... This is why I'm protected, so I'm just curious if there's any other kind of... Def Obviously, there's not. I was just curious. Oh, I got you. No, it's it's always... Look at it as a but, right? All right, I'm the defendant. Let's just say I did everything you claim I did, but... And if that but, whatever comes after that but, is a legitimate legal doctrine that obviates liability, that's an affirmative defense. Right. Gotcha. Any, so anything you. else anything else is not an affirmative defense so qualified immunity it's, let, let's reason our way through it I agree I did everything you said everything but the legal doctrine of qualified immunity protects me that's a true statement so long as they prove the factual predicates right that's a true statement so on those immunity defenses, they would need to put some more um, pleadings on there or more allegations on there for their sides to support that affirmative defense? The, the, equal, the equal, ugh, Iqbal Toombe standard? The Iqbal Twombly, yeah. Um, it, they, they've got to plead sufficient facts to assert or support the affirmative defense, but I can tell you just based on experience, your central district, it depends on who's your judge? Um, I have Jacqueline Shujin as the magistrate and Percy Anderson as the um, as the well, trial judge. Percy Anderson, the the one that would rule on a 12F motion, is going to be the trial judge, not the magistrate. Got um, it. And Percy Anderson, I, I don't know. He he may go for it if they didn't plead enough. If all they said is we're protected by qualified immunity, you know, he he may go ahead and strike it, but he's going to give them leave to amend. Right. So that's that's another consideration. If you don't worry, if you're not worried about spending the time on it, and you're just doing it for experience, yeah, by all means, file the motion. But if okay. you're if you're worried about whether or not you're wasting time that you could be devoting to other more productive stuff, I don't know that I would ever file a motion on qualified or absolute immunity. Um, no, these are just are just blank immunity, immunity, immunity. 
Um, does it say qualified or um, what was the other one they said? Qualified immunity and the absolute immunity. It just says immunity. Oh, well, that's not sufficient on its face. In the Ninth Circuit, they have to, the defendants have the obligation to both plead, properly plead, and prove the immunity. So, I mean, if they, if they just said some weird blanket immunity, and this is, again, just with respect to your federal claims, on the state law claims, it's a different story. It's a, a little loosey-goosey. But on the federal claims, yeah, they got to properly plead it. They can't just say oh. immunity. Got it. Yeah, okay, with that, I'm going to cut out because it's 6 o'clock and I need to have some time to get ready, uh, you know, for the live. I think I'm on tonight. i got to ask James. I'm assuming I am. Anyway, thanks, you guys, for joining. I know that it's uh, <laughs> difficult to use your Sunday afternoon on a three-day weekend to get on here and talk legal jargon, but, you know, Thank I appreciate you. you coming out. You guys have a wonderful night. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.